All right, let me get this uh, shared here. I'm glad we went through and made sure it worked. Yes, sir. All right, so I hope everybody can see that. Everybody got coach. it. Good. All right, so what we're gonna talk about is elite character and culture and how to build that within your program, how to take a, a program that, that maybe hasn't been as successful as it could be, or maybe you feel like there's another level that you could reach and give you a process and a plan on how to get there. Uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I've got 20 years of experience now as an OCDC and special teams coordinator at the high school and college levels. My dad was a coach, he retired about uh, 15 years ago and I uh, was a great role model to learn from. And I was lucky growing up in that I got to play high school and college football for Hall of Fame coaches in uh, Craig Parkinson at Akron Westfield High School and then Larry Corver at uh, Northwestern College in Orange City, Iowa, uh, before I ended up transferring to Briarcliff University. Uh, my first coaching job, I worked for a guy named David Diaz. And he taught me that not only is coaching bigger than winning games, but the impact that you have can last generations and help to build legacies. And then since I've come to Texas, I've gotten to work for three coaches that are going to be in the Texas Coaches Hall of Honor, and that's a really big deal, but Kent Jackson, Marcus Shavers, and now Joe Cluley. And whenever I, I talk, I like to talk about our coaching staff because they're, they're such uh, amazing people. Yeah. I think they're the best coaching staff in the country, but our head coach is a guy named Joe Cluley, who's probably the most positive person that I've ever worked with in my life. And then our defense coordinator, Cody Robinson, is unreal. How this guy is not a head coach, I, I don't know, because he is terrific. But then our offensive line coach is Derek Shelton, receiver coach Jeremy Watson, running back coach Alonzo Franklin. And then our defensive guys, Jeff Lickey, Courtney, Mo Courtney Mosley, and uh, Drew Barnard are all great guys. Our athletic administration in Lubbock is tremendous in Mike Meeks. Jim Garfield and J.J. Johnson, and I actually got to work with Coach Meeks and coach against Coach Garfield, worked with J.J. Johnson, and they're all great people. Our, really, today, I have three goals uh, for you guys in the next 45 minutes to an hour. Number one, I want to give you some tools to push your athletes beyond self-imposed limitations. Uh, number two, I want to help you grow your impact on your athletes. And number three, I want to give you a plan to be more successful on the field that will go way beyond uh, the X's and O's. And one of the things that you know, early on in my career, I used to think that we were slaves to the talent we were given. And we really can't control at the high school level the kids that come to us, but we can control how we coach them. Uh, I know Jeff Conaway, if you watched his uh, deal last night, uh, he talked about this, but um, there was a young guy that went into the, that went and talked to Billy Graham and said, I want to be a youth pastor. And Billy Graham turned to him and said, why? And he said, I want to impact people. And Billy Graham said, well, if you want to impact people, you need to be a coach. Uh, because coaches impact more people in a year than most people impact in a lifetime. Um, the whys, why do we teach character? Why is it important? Well, number one, your character becomes your culture. And I know culture is a big buzzword right now. And, and I know sometimes we get sick of hearing the word, but it exists whether you build it or not. And it all starts with your character. Great character becomes the foundation of our success. And then when we look at what we do as coaches, if we're only teaching football, then what are we really accomplishing? By teaching character, however, you will also have more success on the field. In fact, we've all seen teams that have enormous talent, and we say, how come they don't win? I'm sure you guys have seen that. We've also seen programs where you say, how are they kicking everybody's tail when they don't have a lot of talent? And it's because of the other things, the stuff that we're going to talk about tonight. But I think the, the two biggest points here are great characters on display when you face adversity, and then our kids, our society needs coaches that are going to teach character. Character is not something that's going to show up when things are easy. Everyone has a great attitude when the weather's good, when you're doing an easy workout. That's, that's, when, that's when it's easy. Your character is going to show up when people get squeezed, when they face a little bit of adversity, when you're running 400s at the end of a workout, or it's fourth and goal, and you're playing the number one team in the state, and they're They've been pounding you all game, and you're trying to get that game-winning stop, and it's the third overtime. Are you prepared mentally and character-wise for that moment? Uh, a great quote that I heard early on from a coach when I was, an, I was underachieving, and one of my coaches said, son, you've got talent, but your talent only set the floor. So your talent sets the bottom of what you could be. Your character is what sets the ceiling, and I'm sure every guy in this room 
has people that are in your school, there's kids in your hallways that could be phenomenal athletes that could take your program to another level. However, they don't have a strong enough character to make that happen. And then we've also probably got guys that have broken your heart over the years. Kids that, and when I, what I mean by that is kids that had tremendous talent and maybe we let some things go and we didn't hold them accountable. Maybe we, we set different standards for our best players than we did for our guys that aren't as good. And then that guy breaks your heart. He doesn't show up. He shows up late. He misses a tackle, gets a 15 yard penalty, busts on a play. You know, we've, we've had those guys. So this is where character becomes so important. I will tell you right now that we have an opportunity in just 10 minutes a day to change the lives of our student athletes. And I'm not gonna read through this. What I'll do is coach has a Google Drive that he's gonna post a recording of this and I'm gonna give him this presentation, a PDF file of this, and he can just post that up there. Uh, and that way there's, there's a few things that we'll just touch on. I don't wanna read every slide. I'm gonna give you the gist of it, but some of these longer deals you can, you can go back and read through. Uh, how did we get into this? My second year as an offense coordinator, we had a very, very talented football team that completely underachieved. And when the season got done, I called my dad, who at that time had just retired, and I said, you know, we lo he, he, I was coaching in New York City. My dad was in Iowa where I grew up, and I called him and said, you know, we, we lost this last game, didn't make the playoffs. And he said, what happened? And I said, well, we didn't have leadership. We had a bad senior class. And he said, what did you do to teach leadership? What did you do to develop these people? And I, I, I didn't have an answer. I said, well, you're right. We made a lot of poor decisions on and off the field, and we knew that we had to change because our X's and O's were good. We looked at our, our scheme, and schematically, we were great. We were coaching guys pretty well on the field. I thought we did a good job of coaching our individual stuff. And we had gone through and watched games, and, and we started to see a common thread. Our discipline off the field became a discipline issue on the field. And then it became when things didn't go well, we didn't respond well. So we said, all right, we've got to do more. And all, all I thought about at that point, I was a young coach, was winning games. But what happened was when we got into this, we met a guy named Dennis Parker, who was working at Converse Judson with D.W. Rutledge. And we got to meet D.W. and, 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 uh, and uh, Coach Parker. And what happened is we started to realize that our job as coaches was so much greater than just winning games. And if we do those things, we will make an impact and we will win games. So we focused on coaching character and leadership as much as we did fundamentals and schemes. And we believe in our program and our head coach, Joe Cluley exemplifies this every day. Everything we do is about the relationships we build. I was talking to coach before we started today and you know, my dad has reiterated this to me, and I was lucky to have a dad that knew about impact. Uh, if all we do is win games and we've wasted our opportunity, our job, our, our mission as coaches is to build responsible and accountable young men. We want to prepare them to be great fathers and great husbands and eventually community leaders. We're not preparing them for a football game. We're preparing them for the tools they need to be successful in life and then be able to pass that on to the next generation. You know, we, we think we have a, a blueprint that's infallible. If we focus on building championship culture on the field and in the classroom and in the weight room, and then carry that into the community, it will take place on the field as well. Now, I'm gonna give you some stats here that, that these are scary. When, when I looked at these numbers, as I was getting ready to give this talk a couple of years ago, it, everything became more meaningful but 24.7 million young people under 18 are being raised without their father, and 43% of children live without their dad in their home. And then you start to look at what happens from that. 71% of pregnant teenagers come from fatherless homes, and 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes, and 85% of kids in jail come from fatherless homes. If we look at our own programs, we're noticing this trend where more and more kids are being raised without a father. And things happen. We can't control that. I know there's, there, there are guys that I've coached with who are in the situation where they, they had the marriage not work out or the things happened and they're not necessarily with the child. But we have a responsibility as coaches. We have a, a, a mission as coaches that we can help to fill that gap. We may not be able to fill the whole thing, but we can fill part of that. 
and and I've I've been around so many kids over the years that don't have a positive male role model in their life. And we as coaches have the opportunity every day to be with those young people. Now I'm going to say this before I get into culture. D Cody Robinson, our defense coordinator, says something every day. He reminds us as coaches of something very important. If we kick a kid out of our program, we no longer have the opportunity to influence that kid in the same way. Now, I'm not telling you to let kids run amok, but I'm telling you that the hardest kids to love, the, hard, the kids that are the most difficult to keep around are the ones that we need to work the hardest to keep in our program. Uh, so that's something that, I, that's the premise that I'm coming from. Our job is not to get rid of kids. That is the easy thing to do when you have a difficult kid. Our job is to find a way to take that kid. If he's a, you know, if we look at, you know, you got three levels of kids and your level ones are your kids that they're all in. Your level twos are your kids that they're in most of the time. Your level threes are the kids that are, they're not in very often. Well, our job is try to get those level threes to level twos, level twos to level one, and then take the level threes that we got to level two and maybe get them to be level one kids. So this all doesn't start one kid at a time. It starts with the entire organization. It, do we have something people want to be a part of? So when we talk about culture, I know this is a buzzword now, but it's all it is is the attitudes and behaviors of your team, your program. You take all those attitudes and behaviors that every single person, and you put them into a pile, and that's your culture. And it exists whether you build it or not. See, this is what I didn't understand when I first started coaching, is that no matter what we did, or didn't do, we're going to have culture. Someone is going to control the locker room. Someone is controlling the message. Someone is controlling the behaviors. Someone is influencing those. Is it us or are we just leaving it to chance? So that's your, that's your choice as a coach. Are we building a, our culture by design or by chance? And it's not just the culture within the team, because I hear some guys say, well, I'm just an assistant, or I'm just the seventh grade B team coach. No, there's no just. Every single coach has the opportunity to take your unit. So if you have a unit, if, as the offense coordinator, I'm the head coach for the offense. Derek Shelton's our offensive line coach. He is the head coach for the offensive line. Drew Barnard's our defensive line coach. He's a head coach for the defensive line. What we are doing is building a culture within our unit and then taking that unit culture and helping to mold the team culture. Now, obviously, that all has to be aligned. You have to have some vertical alignment. But what we're going to do is take our position group, our, our area that we're in charge of, and we're going to make that group, we're going to build the culture of that group to help the team culture. You're in total control of your group. And I've been in, I, I was in a coaching situation once where there was, there, it just, it wasn't a great situation. And guys had been there and it was great people. It just, it wasn't a great situation for, for leadership and, and, and the, there wasn't much culture and, and I wasn't in that situation very long because I feel like if you're in a situation you don't believe in, you need to find a situation you do. And, uh, but what I did do was took my position group, said I'm going to make this position group the best that I can make it. I'm going to take this offense and build that culture within this offense, make the best that, I, that it can be. And I'm going to be really loyal to the program. I'm going to make it part of the program, try to help the program. I'm not going to do it over here and say, well, I'm doing this better than the program. No, you're building it within the program. So I want you to understand that. Now, one of the things that we're going through right now, you got a bunch of staff development we're all doing is, you know, we, we're doing the, 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 the virus teach and we're teaching from home. And uh, everybody here has been to staff development and they, they always pull out a mission statement. And for a lot of groups, the mission statement is something that is multiple pages and nobody knows what it is. How many of you guys even know the mission statement for your organization, your school? Most of us don't, all right? Unless you're lucky, Lubbock ISD has a, has a mission statement that's pretty simple. It's every child every day. So, so we can, you know, they, they went and they didn't go spend a million dollars to go to a, 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 a retreat to come up with that. They smart people, they sat down, they, they came up with it every child every day and we all live it. We have a mission statement for our program. Uh, when I was a head wrestling coach, I had a mission statement for the program. But as an individual coach, I have a mission statement. Your mission statement is when things get really hard, that, that mission statement is your why of why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you willing to get up early in the morning? Why are you willing to push through the grind? Why are you willing to spend time away from your family? 
Why are you willing to fight through the, the battles that you're going to face every day for sometimes in a situation where you may not have a lot of triumph or you're facing some adversity? Why are you going to push through that? That's your personal mission. I think every coach needs to have one. But if you're a head coach or an offense coordinator, you, you lead a position group, you need to have a mission for your position group. And the shorter it is, the better. One or two sentences to be the best we can be, to mold young men to be great fathers and husbands, something simple like that. And it doesn't necessarily have to deal with football. Football can be a part of it, but what we're really trying to do is build men. And by building men, we're going to be more successful in football. So let's talk about the process. We talk about we're going to build this elite championship culture and culture and character work together because your character is your culture. All right, so we have four steps. There's four elements of this. Number one, you've got to have a vision. It's got to be clear and compelling. It can't be some long thing. It's got to be something simple that people can grasp. Number two, you've got to have some core values. These are just things you stand for. Number three, you've got to have standards. You've got to have specific standards of behavior. And number four, you've got to have compelled team members. And what we mean by that is people who are bought in and all in. And that doesn't happen overnight. So let's talk about, oh, coach, what's up? Yeah, I got a question here. <clears throat> Uh, as the OC at your school, what is your mission statement for your offense? Our mission statement is to be the most explosive and efficient offense in the state of Texas to become the best offense ever to be in the state of Texas. And our, that's our kids. We talk about it all the time. We want to be the best offense that ever existed in the state of Texas. And every day we're taking another step to get there. It's a stretch. It's a stretch. You, you know, you look at 1,285 football playing schools – playing every year for over 100 years. That's over a million schools. But you know what? We're going to try to be the best we can be. Um, so come up with that, 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 that vision for your, your deal. What is your vision? And I think it's got to be articulated. People got to know it. Ours is pretty short for our kids. We say we're going to be the best offense ever in the state of Texas. We'd, how do we do it? Explosive and efficient. We talk about being explosive and efficient. And then we're going to be the most physical team on the field. So everyone – within your part of that organization. So if that's your vision for your offense, then you have to get buy-in from everybody. So we have buy-in, our coaches have to buy in, our kids have to buy in, and then we've got to share our vision with everybody around us, everybody who touches our program. So the head coach and the defense coordinator have to be bought in on our offensive vision. We've got to be bought in on their defensive vision. We have to have a program vision, and that helps to unify the organization and I heard a, 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 it was interesting, and I don't remember who was talking about it. It might have been Urban Meyer. But he said, and this was back, you know, when he was at Ohio State, I think maybe the second or third year. And he said, everybody that touches our program has to be all in. From the person that is cleaning, you know, the, 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 throwing the trash out at 2 o'clock in the morning, they've got to be bought in too. And everybody touches your kids. And I remember getting to the – to when I was in the Bronx, New York, and we got to a program that had lost 27 games in a row. I think they scored six points a year before we got there. And everybody kept saying, you guys suck. You'll never win. Teachers said it. Other kids said it. And they thought we were a little crazy when we said our vision is to develop a program that will win championships. And, and our championships were on and off the field. And they thought we were crazy. What we had to do is get them to buy in. And all we did was ask them. Hey, when you're around our kids, please do not ever tell them they're not going to be successful. Do not ever tell them that they can't do something. And this goes for educators everywhere. Nothing makes me more sick than when I hear a kid say that that teacher said I'm stupid. That teacher said that I'll never be this. No way. That's a dream stealer, man. That's what we can't do. We've got to build guys up. Now, that doesn't mean unrealistic. But it does mean we've got to have some big dreams and our vision has to be big. And then we've got to tell people we need your support. Everybody from the custodian to the secretary in the front office and give them t-shirts, give them, get some pins made. You can get a thousand pins for about 12 bucks with your organization's deal and hand them out. You know, sell cheap t-shirts, get you some $3 t-shirts, sell them for five bucks, give some away, give the, don't charge the principal now. Give the principal a free shirt, try to get them on board. If you don't have a vision, you know, and we all know there's, there's programs like this. They're just basically, you've, you've got a, a, a person that's in charge of a team. They're not building a program. They're a sponsor. You know, there's no vision. And 
in that case, you're not going to have a lot of success because someone else is going to develop your vision. Someone else is going to determine where you're going. And then you have some people that'll talk about their vision. You're like, what are you even talking about? Because their vision has no clarity. So you've got to have a very clear vision, meaning short, simple, to the point, and something everybody can wrap around. We're going to build champions on and off the field. That's a great vision. Uh, we're going to compete to win championships on the field. We're going to compete. I know Hal Wasson, when he was at South Lake Carroll, used to say, we're going to try to be the last team standing in December. How do we do that? By building really strong character, by having a strong culture, and doing the little things right each and every day. Uh, so when we build our vision, we want to start with the end in mind. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to end up? So we're going to start with our purpose and then our goal. So we want to look at, well, we want to develop, you know, for us, for our offense, we want to be the best offense ever in the state of Texas. We want to do it through efficiency and explosiveness. That pretty much cuts it all down and gives some simplicity that everybody can see. Uh, the next thing, you got to articulate it. Everybody's got to be all in. I kind of talked about this already. Everybody affiliated with your program, everybody that might touch your program has to be bought in with this. Next is core values. All right, vital. This is part two. What do we stand for? So when we got to the Bronx, we got to Columbus High School back in 1998. They weren't very good. We got them really good. And then, you know, of course, after the 05 season, a couple of us left and got other opportunities. 06 season, a couple guys left and they, they kind of fell back off. But we, we really built a great program there. The first thing we did was we, our kids didn't know how to be champions. They'd never wanted anything. They hadn't won a game. Not one kid in that program had ever won a football game in their life. So they didn't know what it took to win. So what we did was we said, if we want to learn what a champion is, let's go visit some champions. So we took a few kids and went and visited some programs. We actually got to go see the, the New York Giants, or New York Jets rather, watch them practice. And then we went and watched a couple of really good high school programs, took a few of our kids and watched a couple of college programs locally and saw what they were doing. And then we, we had our kids, we brought them in on a Saturday, and we said, all right, what do we stand for? What is it going to take? If we were a championship program, what would our practice look like? If we were a championship program, what would our team meetings look like? What did you see from these other groups? And from that, we came up with our identity. And what we wanted to be, if people came to watch our practice, what would they see? So we came up with these five things. We came up with toughness which was not physical toughness, it was mental toughness. Next was honesty, then accountability, trust, and love. And those were the things that our guys felt were most important for our program. Now, once you come up with your core values and what you stand for, then you have to have some standards of performance. What do we talk about when we talk about standards of performance? If you are going to have an expectation, then every single person must understand the expectation and the standard and be held accountable. And we talk about all the time, there is no such thing as a small thing. The little things are what win championships and the little things are what get you beat. And it's the same thing in life. If you show up for work five minutes late, every time you go to work, you're going to get fired. If you show up late to practice, you're probably not going to play as much. If you're late getting to the football, you're not very valuable on defense. If you don't know your assignment because you haven't taken time to study the playbook, you're probably not going to be very successful on the field. And then when you go to your, your, in your, in your grown-up life and you have a career, you need to be prepared for work each day. So what we talk about is there's no small things because the small things matter most. Second, we're going to coach the details. And we're going to coach every rep. Every single rep, you've got to give feedback, positive and negative. If you're just standing there with your hands in your pockets, then you probably need to go get another line of work. And what we tell our guys, we, we have a lot of young coaches come through. You know, I have a goal as an offense coordinator that every coach that comes to our offensive staff moves on and gets to be a coordinator. I want them to be able to move on and grow in the profession. And then someday when they get a head coaching job, maybe I'll go work for them. So what we want to do is to, we want our coaches to be developing guys. We want coaches to have goals and want to develop kids and coach them every single rep. Now, one of the things that we talk about when we correct a standard is, it was the standard clearly defined. Did the kid understand the standard? If not, then we need to reteach the standard. Or is he not capable yet of reaching that standard? Is it something that he's not quite good enough to get to? Okay, we need to recognize that. And then third, did he just not care? 
That's an important thing. Did he not give the effort to reach the standard? Now, I'm going to use parallel squat as an example. We have a definition of parallel squat in our program. Everybody's held to the standard. Top of the thigh is parallel to the floor. That's the definition of parallel. Top of the thigh, parallel to the floor. I'm sure guys have seen the Twitter videos of a guy saying I squatted 700 pounds and he did a half squat. Maybe that's their definition. Ours is not. We would not tweet that out. When our guys max out, and I'm sure you guys have all had it, where a guy will come to your rack, he'll max out at 305, and then tomorrow you look at the sheet and he did 400. How did he do 400? Well, because the coach that he went to and put that weight on, let him get away with a lesser squat. So everybody's got to have a clear definition of the standard, and then everybody's got to hold the same accountability level. I think that's very important, and that's where a lot of programs make a mistake. If we say you're going to start behind the line and someone's on the line or in front of the line, and we don't say anything, we just failed our kids. If we said, well, today I'm kind of tired, so I'm not going to hold the kid accountable for running through the line because it's going to bring a little bit of conflict, then we're not going to be as good as we can be. Everyone has to be unified, and you can't let people deviate from the standard, and this is where most people fail. Most people fail because they'll hold people accountable to the standard as long as it's comfortable. We want kids to be uncomfortable and face some adversity, then we as coaches have to be able to do uncomfortable things. And one of those is to, there's going to be conflict when you correct people. And I'm not talking about it in a negative way. Great coaches are able to build strong relationships. And this is where relationships come in that we'll talk about. When you have great relationships, you can correct somebody and they understand that it's because you love them. You're correcting them, doing something for them, not doing something to them. Until you have the relationship, the kid may not see it that way. But you must be consistent. If the kid knows that, man, if, you know, if three or four of us do this, then they'll start letting it go, then it's not going to be very good. So when we talk about accountability, see so your core values and your character and your, your culture only become as good as the accountability that you have. If someone deviates from the standard, you got to hold them accountable. And again, is it clear? Is the standard clear? Or did they not care? Do we need to reteach the standard? This happens. Hey, we've done that as coaches. Hey, I didn't teach you well enough. Let's reteach this. Hey, we've gotten away from holding you accountable. We had to do it this season, game seven, game eight, rather. I think it was game eight. Didn't play very well. Didn't have a sense of urgency. Got him in the meeting room. We took us, we as coaches, shoot, it was me. I said, guys, I failed you this week. I didn't have you prepared. We didn't hold you accountable. We thought this wasn't going to be a very difficult game. I don't think we coached you to play championship football. Now we need you to give championship effort. And I can guarantee you this, we're not going to let any of this stuff go. So they understood. Now, here's an important quote. Permitting is promoting. When you permit something, you promote it. So if you say nobody wears earrings in the weight room and one kid wears earrings in the weight room, the next day you're going to have five kids wearing it if you don't correct the one. If you let one kid not, cruise through, not sprint through the line, you let him cruise through, the next day you're going to have five kids. They're going to do the same thing. How many people have a hats in school rule? A lot of people. I remember it being in the Bronx. No hats in school, but about 50% of our kids wore hats because 5% of the people held them accountable. And most people wouldn't do it because the minute you'd say, take your hat off, you were going to have some conflict. Everybody has discipline rules in their school that people are not held accountable. Well, look at this in your program. You can't control whether that's happening in your school necessarily. But look at your program. If you have a standard in your program and you're not going to enforce it, every other standard becomes optional. So if you have a standard you're not going to enforce, get rid of the standard. If you have a standard, no hats in school, and you're going to let kids wear hats, get rid of the rule, because every other rule just became optional. That is vital. Now, something else I'm going to tell you before we get to compelled team members. If you, and I want you to think of this, because a lot of times our best players are some of the most difficult guys, some of the best athletes, some of the guys that have the, that, that speed, the talent, but they have difficult lives at home. They have difficult, they, they struggle with discipline. They struggle with doing what they're asked to do. They kind of want to be in charge because a lot of those kids are in charge when they leave. They don't have anybody any, 22 hours a day, no one's telling them what to do. And now they're being told what to do for a couple hours. So those are some of the toughest kids to coach. All right. Well, if you take that kid that's that's hard to coach, but is really fast, and boy, he could be a really good player, and you will, you baby step him all the time, but then you take the kid that 
isn't as talented, maybe not talented at all, but, you know, he always – he tries as hard as he can, just doesn't have a whole lot going. Maybe he's a little goofy. And you'll dog cuss that kid. You're a bully. We got to hold every kid accountable. Now, not, you're not going to coach every kid the same. That's not what we're saying. But you've got to hold your best players accountable, and you've got to hold your guys that maybe aren't as good accountable. But you've got to do that in different ways. You've got – you're going to – if you have 60 kids in your program, you're going to have 60 different ways that you handle every situation. We tell our kids not everybody's going to be treated the same, but you're all going to be treated fairly. I mean, it's that simple. Now, how does this all start? Well, we need compelled team members. We need people to buy in, and how do they buy in? They are not going to buy into your X's and O's as much. They're not going to buy into the car you drive. They're not going to buy into your coaching clothes. They're going to buy into you as a person. They need a reason to buy in, and the first thing that they want is someone that they can believe in and trust. They want structure, consistency, and discipline. They want that consistent accountability. They want to have structure. When you get into a new situation or you have new kids move in, they're going to try to push those boundaries a little bit. You've got to make sure that you hold the line, but do so in a way that the kid will learn. It ain't about you and your ego. Every kid is going to be handled a little bit different. So, but they want to be held to that high standard. They want someone to believe in them. They want someone to tell them they can be a champion. They want someone to see a lot of our kids, they don't think they can do certain things. They may come out with an outward bravado. But that's really just a mask with the really feeling inside. They need you to genuinely believe in them. When we talk about relationships, the number one thing it comes down to is love. And when we talk about love, we're talking about unconditional love. What do we mean by unconditional love? It means we love you as much on your worst day as we do. Uh, we love you as much on your worst day as we do on your best day. We love you as much when you're getting ISS, when you're getting in trouble, when you miss a workout, we love you just as much as when you score three touchdowns. We love you as much on your worst day as your best day. The more they know you care about them off the field, the more that they will trust you in every environment, including on the field. And once you, your players trust you, once you earn trust, because it's not going to be given, then you're going to build a bond that will last a lifetime. Now, how do we build those relationships? Well, the first thing, love is spelled T-I-M-E. What does that mean? You have to spend time with your dudes away from football. It can be in the field house. It can be giving them rides to and from practice. It can be them popping in when things aren't going well. You got to keep the office doors open unless you're having a meeting. Our kids come hang out, and gosh, they can be loud, but it's a heck of a lot of fun. We love being able to spend time with them. If a kid says, I need a ride, give them a ride. Be there for them, and finally, never break a promise. Never tell a kid you're going to do something, and then you don't do it. Our kids face broken promises each and every day. So we've got to make sure that we're not the one breaking the promise, because how many of them have had a family member say, hey, I'll, I'll make sure you get lunch money, and then they don't do it. Hey, I'll give you a ride to school, and then they don't do it. I'll be at your game, but they're not there. They face that all the time. I'll do this with you, but then they don't. It's one of the hardest things kids face. So when we talk about unconditional love, we're talking about we don't love you for what you do. We love you for who you are. We don't love you when you do only when you do well. We love you as much when you're not doing well. We love you as much on your worst day as your best day, and we're always going to be here for you. That's the thing. Our kids, you know, if you're going to get kids to buy in, they've got to know that you're there for them. And they've got to know that you're someone that they can believe in. They've got to be able to trust you. Once they know they can trust you, then you will become a source for them of ultimate belief, ultimate value, because what you say, they will trust. When you tell them, when you have that hard conversation, they will be able to respond to that in a positive way and learn from it. If they don't trust you, they're going to think that when you tell them something that you're not telling them for their benefit, you're doing it for your benefit. So that trust is important. Once they know that you care about them more off the field than you do on the field, that's when special things will happen and you can't become the next broken promise in their life. You know, we talk about developing attitudes. That's what character really is doing, is we're developing an attitude. An attitude is simply your outward actions based on your inward belief. It's your outward behavior, which comes from your belief inside. 
So what you see coming out of someone is based on what is put into them. So we have to do a great job of coaches as te of teaching character. And how do we do this? Well, something that's important, I think, is you got to choose a level of excess, uh, success. You've got to choose the standard and you get to pick it. You can say the standard is we're going to have 50% attendance. That's a standard you could set. Well, if you're coming from a program where they had 0% attendance in the summer, 50% may be a good start. You could set the standard as 80% or 90% or 100%. You can set the standard as we're going to run through the line. You can set the standard as we're going to run to the line. But whatever you set as the standard, make sure that your accountability matches that. You get to choose everything that you set within your program. You get to choose what you allow from your players. You get to, hey, am I going to allow them to not go full speed? How am I going to handle that? How am I going to hold them accountable? And it doesn't mean you, you dog cuss a kid because he makes a mistake or you put him on the line or you make him bear crawl every single mistake. Every kid is different. Does that kid need the standard retaught? What happened that day that may have caused that kid to have an issue? What did we do as a coach? And I know a lot of times we get frustrated with administrators when they come in our room and maybe we handled a situation and, and didn't do it in a great way and they come in and we sent the kid out and they come in and they send the kid right back and we don't think they did anything. We don't know what they did and maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. But we always say, what did we do to start that situation? And I've had it happen a few times because I coach really hard and I sometimes get aggressive and sometimes I back a kid in a corner. And if you back a dog in the corner, he's going to bark. Well, you got to be able to handle that as a coach and say, all right, hey, let's squash the situation. It ain't about me. It's about how can we help you be successful? Because the minute we start making it about us, that's when we're going to start to lose the trust of the kids. So we're not going to accept less than the standard, but we're going to handle each kid in the best way for that kid. Now, another deal here that's really big is celebrate success. Catch them doing something well. I think this is important. You've got to catch kids having success, especially kids that struggle with success. If you have a kid that, you know, maybe he's not, he benches 95 pounds. Well, he gets 105, celebrate the crap out of that because then he's going to do 115 and then 135. And, and when we talk about this, I want you to understand something else. Don't coach kids where they are. Coach them for what they can be. Too often we look at a kid and we limit the kid in our own head. Well, he's only this. He could only be this. And that's how you're going to coach him. You got to coach every kid like he is going to be a factor in a state championship football game. Like that kid is going to be the difference between winning or losing. And I'll tell you something that happened when I when I was early in my career. Uh, I didn't give our backup quarterback very many, actually our third string kid, very many reps. He didn't have many opportunities. I didn't really think he could do it. And then he had to play and he didn't do very well. And we were so limited on what we could do. And after that game, our head coach, David Diaz, said, you know, you, this is exactly what you – you got what you prepared for. And he said – and I said, well, you could have said something before it happened. He said, no, you had to learn this lesson. You know, and he, and he actually said, I did try to tell you. He didn't listen, and I probably didn't. Uh, and it was a growth moment. I saw that kid as a five foot six, 135-pound kid and ended up coaching him to not be his best. I didn't give him very many reps, didn't ask him a lot of questions in meetings. I didn't help him to grow, and then all of a sudden he had to play. And then, not only that, then that kid ended up not playing football after that year because I didn't coach him very well. Why would he want to stay out? I, I didn't believe in him. He's not going to stay out for that. And then he grows three inches and then goes to another school and has some success. So coach every kid, every kid like it's your own son. And then we talk about building leadership. And this is, there's no mystery to this. Building leadership is putting kids in positions of leadership. Now, obviously, when you start to change your culture and build that character, you're going to have a lot of benefits off the field that are going to help you on the field. You're going to have a better GPA. Less students are going to be ineligible. We have less kids going to summer school than ever before. You're going to have better school and work at attendance. You know, we talk about it at Estacado. People used to say when, when we got there, and I, I coach against Estacado, if we can just make them get a little adversity, they'll get 15-yard penalties. They'll do things on the field to implode. And that's one of the things we're most proud of is every team that we've played the last since we've been there four years now, every year we hear this more and more. That's not the same football team. And that starts with the leadership of, of Marcus Shavers, who was our, our head coach in 16 and 17, and now Joe Cluley, who's been our head coach the last two years. Phenomenal guys. 
but they emphasize this where we coach them through the details, we coach them hard, but we build these strong relationships and we focus on character. We focus on character in everything we do. We might be coaching the squat, but what we're really coaching is character. We might be coaching how to double team block, but we're really coaching trust and love and character. And your field house is going to have a different feel. And here's a big deal is fourth quarter effort. A lot of guys tell me that offseason gets to be a grind, but I'm going to tell you right now, this is the most important time of year. You cannot wait until August to start building culture. It's too late. Everything that you do from right now, from, from January when offseason started, until you get ready to start in August matters. Now we're in a different situation. We're not around our kids every day. We can't be at this point. So it's something I think very, very important that we're finding creative ways to be able to get our guys working. Yes, coach. Uh, coach wants to know, do you and your team uh, take part in any service opportunities around the community? If so, have you noticed a change in the attitude of your players towards football and life off the field? Such a phenomenal question. And yes, the more they get involved in the community, the more they grow as people. I think that community service is one of the greatest things to open kids' eyes. Two things that I think we do real, that are really great. Number one, we do a thing called Reading with the Matadors. Our kids during the season, we used to do it game days, now we do it on Thursdays. They go to our feeder elementary schools and they read to the kindergarten, first and second grade kids. It's, we break them into small groups. The football team goes, the band goes, the cheerleaders go. And, uh, and it's really great for those kids and it's great for our kids. And then another thing, we have some kids that volunteer at the food bank. And, um, you know, we have a lot of kids that also get some services through the food bank. But it's a really neat deal to see them give back. Uh, when I was uh, at the college level, we used to do a community cleanup weekend where we'd go clean in the community. So I think those things are all great. And those are great things to do in the off season as well. Uh, when I was at Columbus High School, we went to Pelham Bay Park and we did a cleanup over a six-week period. Through the National Football Foundation, we cleaned uh, a bunch of trails. It was really an awesome thing. Um, but off-season, man, is when this is when you get to build. So you get to take time right now to say, this is our standard. This is our expectation. You know, we talk about tempo. Tempo is not a speed of play. Tempo is a way of life. Tempo is about playing with a sense of urgency in everything you do. It's not about snapping the ball at 36 on the play clock. We can do that. But your tempo is how you do things. How, how much urgency can you do something with while still having attention to details? Something important here that, I, that Cody Robinson and our head co uh, who's our DC and Joe Cluley, our head coach, talk about all the time, your players are a direct, direct reflection of your coaching. If you want to see your coaching, put the film on. Well, this is when we have to start doing that's in the weight room. And I'd, I, hey, I'd suggest film in the weight room a couple minutes each day. Just film the weight room and watch and see, do we need to coach this better? Do we, it's okay. It's okay that you're going to make mistakes as coaches. Part of being a great leader is having a little bit of humility to say, man, I got to coach that better. I got to teach that better. I didn't have a great day in the weight room today. Throw a film on, throw a phone up, have a coach hold a phone up and just film for two or three minutes, just randomly. And then watch and see how you're doing. Do you have passion and energy? because that's vital in the off season as we're building the, the character and culture. If, you're, if everybody thinks your character talks are a beat down, then they're gonna be a beat down. So you gotta bring some passion and energy. We do five minutes, we do Be A Man Monday, every Monday. We're gonna take five minutes and a different coach is gonna present. And they're gonna give that word of the week and then we're gonna quiz them throughout the week on that word. And it's gonna be applicable, not only to sport, but to their life outside of sport. Now, we always talk about the one thing every program needs to improve, and that's mental toughness. And we defined it. It's the ability to face adversity and failure with great effort, enthusiasm, and a positive attitude. How do you handle things when it gets tough? Well, your character is going to show this. It's our mental toughness is developed through our character. We need to teach our players how to be mentally tough and how to have grit. So Angela Duckworth, a bunch of years ago, did a study I think she was at the University of Pennsylvania on the number one factor in determining success. And it had nothing to do with talent, ability, or physical attributes. It was 100% grit, which is mental toughness. How do we do it? You put your players in adverse situations. Adversity is the key. If the first adversity they face is on Friday night, you're not going to win. What is adversity? It's discomfort. That's all it is. I'm in a un an uncomfortable situation. So you put them in that situation. One of the things we did, I was in the military. I was in the Army for eight years, carried a rifle. 
And after any mission we went on, after any, anything that we did, we had an after action review. And we would evaluate what we did right, what we did wrong, and what we need to improve the next time that we face any type of a conflict. You need to do the same with your players. How do we put them in adverse situations? Well, finish a workout, put them on the track, and run two 200s and tell them they got to make a time. But don't yell out the time because then you lose control. Sometimes you're going to say, we're going to run it till we make it, and they're never going to make it. So you need that control. You can make 28 seconds, be whatever the heck you want. You know, I remember the first time I did it, man, we had done about four of these, and the head coach said, what are, you, what are you doing? And I said, well, we haven't made it yet. He said, they're probably getting slower, aren't they? I said, yeah. He goes, give them a two-minute break. Gave him a two-minute break. Gave him some recovery, and he said, listen. He said, here's what I want you to do. No matter what time that deal's going to be, you make sure every kid makes it. So you can tell them you got to make it in 28. But that clock may be at 40, and you're going 26, 27, 28. You have control. This, but we put them through adversity. And then we'll tell them, hey, it took us four times to make it. That's not good enough. Or we can say, hey, we had to lower the standard. So what do we need to make the standard if we're going to be champions? So you got to put them in uncomfortable situations. Make them run two 400s after workout. You don't even have to give them a time. Just say, we need to see everybody pushing through the line. And if we don't do it, we're going to do this. And it may be 10, 10 yard sprints. But you need to gradually build up that level of adversity. Start with something relatively small, especially if you're taking over a program uh, where they don't have a lot of mental toughness. And then gradually build that up. And it's got to include, and this is important, you've got to have a level of thinking and communication under pressure. You've got to have something that they're doing that's hard when they're tired and they've got to think and communicate. Because that's what happens in games is the third and fourth quarter – they get tired, they face a little bit of pressure, and then they can't think and communicate the right way. One of the things that we talk about is everything that you do affects others. That's us as coaches and our players. Everything they do is going to have an effect on someone else. I know that uh, Tim and Brian Kite talk about E plus R equal O. You're going to have an event. You're going to have a response. That response is going to lead to an outcome. But your response is going to become an event for someone else. So you can affect others in a positive way or a negative way. Coaches also affect others. Your energy level either lifts the room or you're a vampire that sucks energy from the room. I think we've got to talk to our kids about that. And we've got to realize as coaches that our energy level is going to affect everybody around us. Now let's talk real quick about barriers to success. We're about to close this up. Yes, sir. Uh, a question here, coach. How do you balance uh, the pushing them with adversity, but also following the new uh, feed the cats mentality? Well, the deal, the big deal is, see, our kids, you know, the big thing with that is the, the amount of contact that you can have. I think we go live maybe five times all year, probably for five minutes each time. We just, we just we don't do a lot of live stuff. Um, but what we try to do is give them, like I said, we're going to start relatively small, and then we're going to gradually build that level of adversity. And it may be something, I'll give you a simple thing we're, that we were doing in the weight room. Uh, we went and watched Waco La Vega practice and kind of stole this from them. And uh, Cody Robinson again runs this, but he, it's five perfect sit-ups. So the whole team's doing five perfect sit-ups. They got to do five perfect ones, but you're given some mental stuff. It's at the end of the workout. So we might say, you're going to go up on the word blue. You're going to go down on the whistle. If you miss, if you flinch, if you start at the wrong time, start late, start early, don't do a full push-up then you're doing wall sits the rest of the exercise and everybody else starts at zero. You only got five. So we'll blow the whistle. And someone will flinch. Now they're on the wall. So then we might blow the whistle. Green, blue, everybody should come up. And then while they're up, we might say red, yellow. Somebody flinches, they're on the wall. We might get to three and then it gets tough and then they start at zero. So you're adding some adversity. It's very difficult. We're going to do it until we do five or everybody's on the wall. And I think that's a great little thing to do. Offensively, if we have bad ball security, we fumble, we bust on a play, we do one perfect up down. What does that mean? We're going to do one up down. But we have a definition of a perfect up down. Everybody's feet are hot. When the whistle blows, everybody hits their chest on the ground. They push off with their hands and their feet, pop up, and jump into the air and yell one. If anybody doesn't count, if anybody doesn't touch their chest, if anybody doesn't push off the ground, if anybody gets to their knee first, it doesn't count. We're still at zero. So we're going to do one, but it might take us five to get there. It might take us 10, but we're only doing one. So that's a little thing to teach attention to detail, 
but put them into some adversity. One of the things that we do in our weight room that I think is the greatest thing we do is we blow guys up and call them out. You had the wrong weight on the bar. We're going to blow the whistle. Everybody's going to get in a push-up position. They're in the up position, and the coach is going to call them out. Music turns off. We say, little Johnny had 265 on the bar. He was supposed to do 285. That'll get us beat. Boom, we blow the whistle. They do a push-up. We have them do one, two, three, whatever. And then we say feet, and they jump up. So it might be one push-up, and we might do that 10 times in a workout. It's 10 extra push-ups. But it's the adversity they face and the accountability of their teammates. So that's just a few thoughts to answer that question. But I think you have to do – if you're not willing to do stuff like that because it's uncomfortable as a coach, then you're probably not going to be as successful as you can be. Um, when we talk about barriers to success – and that's – by the way, guys said, well, you're in Texas. Did the same thing in New York. Did the same stuff in New York City. Did the same stuff. It doesn't really change. The key is having great relationships with players and build relationships with your booster club and your parents. Don't be afraid to build relationships with parents. Don't be afraid to have con the more we tell our parents. I mean, I tell offensive parents all the time. I tell our quarterback's dad last year. Listen, here's what I need, and he's awesome. He is awesome. Hey, I'm gonna make some bad play calls. I'm probably gonna put Jalen in some situations that are that where he's going to have to bail us out. Just be positive with him at the dinner table. I already know I'm an idiot sometimes. You know, don't remind him of that. He's like, all right. When I was at the college level, I used to do a, a, a call with our quarterbacks. We had three quarterbacks. I used to do a call with their dads once a week. And just a 10, 15-minute call with each dad. Tell them, here's what he's doing well. Here's what he's not doing. Here's what he's got to do better. And they appreciated that. And it kind of helped with some of that stuff. So I think when – when you're talking about this new mentality, you've got to have great relationships. That's vital. And then uh, number two, uh, you've got to find ways to hold kids accountable where you're not – you're getting them uncomfortable, but you're not pushing them to that limit where, shoot, he's sadistic. This guy's crazy. Yes, sir. Coach, uh, have you ever been anywhere where you created a visual of your culture that was placed on a shirt in the locker room, in the weight room, et cetera? Not really. We did do a pyramid that we based off of Pete Carroll. Uh, the pyramid, I can't remember what he called it, the pyramid of champions. Um, but that's as close as we've come. Uh, you know, we, we don't put a lot of signs up. We do have some, a, a few little things up, but you know, players don't really read that stuff. We have a couple things that, uh, around our building that say family, uh, forget about me. I love you. And that is kind of what we represent as a program. Um, but we're not big on the signs, but I've been a few places where we put some things up. I think if you do that, you got to spend some time showing the kids and reminding them what it means. Uh, but that's a great idea to do. Um, we're limited on budget, so we have to pick and choose where it goes. And the family impact aspect and the hashtag families really helped us to be able to build our culture. Uh, a few of the barriers that kids face, low self-esteem. I think that's important. And if you, you have a choice as a coach, you can build their self-esteem up or you can lower it. Now, there's this mistake, this self-esteem stuff that came through in the 80s and 90s and, and ruined a lot of kids because there was only positive with it. No, no, it doesn't mean that you're going to let stuff go. It means that when we talk about this, we're going to see them for what they can be, and we're going to tell them, you could be this, but you got to do these things. Now, I'm going to tell you guys something that, that I do with every player now. It's called the Game Plan for Life. I sit down with them, beginning of fall, done it with our position group. We're going to do it with the whole offense this year. It's real fast. They're going to list their academic goal for the year. They're going to list three football goals for the year. And then I want them to visualize what they're going to be doing in 10 years. What do they see themselves doing in 10 years? Then on the back, we're going to list what we need to do, the five steps to get where we want to be in 10 years. Here's the cool thing. I used this a few years ago. We need to bring it, we're bringing it back. Here's the cool thing about this. Little Johnny, he's struggling. He wants to go to college and play Division I football, all right? He's 6'3", he's 225, he runs a 4'6", 40, all right? Maybe he wants to be a doctor, but he fails every science class. He's got 2.2 GPA. He misses class. I can call him in. Hey, what was your goal? Division I football. What's the academic requirements? Got to have a, you know, sliding scale, this with this. All right, so you got a 2.2 GPA. Can you play Division I football? Can you be eligible? No, sir. All right, so here's our choice. We can change your goal or we can change your behavior. Should we lower your goal to meet your behavior or do you want to raise your behavior to meet your goal? I think that's something important. We called it the game plan for life. Just build a little thing like that. Football goal, classroom goal, maybe a community service goal, 
and then a 10 year, where do they see themselves in 10 years and then write down the steps to get there. Um, and that way we can build them up while still holding them accountable and doing self-esteem has to be done the right way. You know, we, I think education failed. Parenting failed because we were told you got to tell every kid that their crap don't stink. That's false. We've got to set really high standards, build great relationships, and then hold kid, kids accountable. But one of the things we've got to do when you're walking around the weight room is you can't tell that 135-pound freshman, hey, we got to get you lifting more weight. you got to say, look, dude, this is what you could do. Man, I see you being this. Hey, if you work really hard, you could be this, but you got to work hard to get there. I like having them write down, hey, okay, well, this is where I really want to be because then we can hold them accountable to it. A lot of kids have a negative attitude because they don't really believe inside themselves. So we got to give them that belief. They have a fear of, fear of failure. That's why kids don't throw the hands anymore. They don't want to get beat up on Snapchat. I'm glad we didn't have social media growing up, by the way. Hell, a lot of us on this call probably couldn't have got a job if we'd had it growing up. Uh, that's why when kids do stuff and it's on social media, hey, we probably did a lot of the same stuff. It just wasn't out there in public. They've got a little more pressure. So we've got to remind ourselves of that. Constant broken promises at home. We talked about that. People accept low expectations. In many of our schools, mediocrity is the norm, man. We cannot let mediocrity be the norm. We've got to set a standard, and elite is the standard. That's it. That's the only way it can be. Doesn't mean every kid's going to be elite, but that's our standard. How are we going to develop them to get there? The only person that can limit you is you, and I think you've got to remind kids of this. The person who we most have to overcome is the one we look in the mirror, and I bet we do that as coaches. Every coach in this room, ah, man, I could never do that. I could, man, I couldn't be a division one coach, man. I could, I'll tell you this, a lot of the guys that are on this call, a lot of high school coaches, junior high coaches, youth coaches, there's a lot of those guys that go off and probably coach at any level, but they're where they are right now for a purpose. Let's make that work and believe in yourself. Greatness is a choice, but it's a conscious choice that we must make every day. And our circumstances don't define it. It doesn't matter where we are right now. It doesn't matter where you are as a coach right now. Take advantage of the situation we're in and grow where your feet are and then exceed yourself and pose limitations. And that's got to happen with your kids. Don't let them limit themselves to I'm just this or I can only be this. The most important guys in football right now are youth and middle school coaches because they're the ones that have the first opportunity to impact kids. 60% of kids will not play football after their first year playing. That's a fact. That, why does that, that, that's our low participation numbers. Why? Well, parents fear injury. And then somewhere along the way, they had a coach give them a negative experience or a parent give them a negative experience. So those middle school and youth coaches are vital, man. They're the ones that get kids to love the game. We have an opportunity every day to write the story for our kids. I want you to look at every kid as a canvas. Help them paint the picture that they want to have on there. If we use our influence the right way, we can help to break cycles of poverty. We can help to grow kids to be greater than what they'll ever think they can be. Blake Sanford, who I used to coach with, he's the athletic director down in early Texas now. Worked with him a few years ago. And Blake, people used to say, how's your team going to be? And he'd say, I don't know, but I'll tell you in 20 years. Because he looks at his job as, as a coach, as molding men, that, are, that, that his success will be measured by what they do 10, 15, 20 years down the road. We may be the only stale, st uh, stable, positive male role model that that kid has. So let's just review this real quick. Be consistent with your players. I think that's vital. Number, number two, be yourself. Don't be someone you're not. Be you. Love your players unconditionally. That means on their worst day as much as you do on their best day, and they got to know it, man. Sometimes your kids, they've had a bad day. They need a dang hug. They need someone to sit down and let them pour their heart out and know that it's okay to do that. When they make a mistake, coach and correct. Don't let it go and don't berate a mistake. Coach and correct them and then remind them you believe in them. And, man, hold them accountable to the standards you set. I think we've got it. We talked about building them up to give them confidence. Hey, you've done this, so you're prepared for this. I remember uh, my college coach used to say that all the time. Hey, you're prepared for this situation because of what we did. Your words as a coach are powerful. And then you've got to build leadership with your players and let them know their words are powerful. A quick thing to develop leadership, take leaders in your program. I do this with quarterbacks. Hey, go out tomorrow. you got to get three guys' cell phone numbers, three guys that you don't know. And then you've got to text them some positive message. Take three guys that aren't – they. I don't want them to go get a varsity starter. I want them to get a backup, a young guy, and then send that positive message to them. And then do three more the next day. Things like that. Implementing character is an investment. But it, 
listen, build in a little bit of time. It's not a four hour a week activity. Some guys do that and it works for them. Find what works for your program. Be flexible with it. What does your team need? Excuse me. One of the things to do if you don't know where to go, find an expert. Um, the Real Man program developed by Frank DeCoco, run by the Hope Foundation's good. Two words, Stephen Mackey's great. Uh, the football journey. I mean, there's a bunch of good stuff out there. Go find those. But we have an opportunity every day to impact kids and to change the trajectory of their future and ultimately build our program to be what we want it to be. You get to shape the vision. You get to shape your core values. You get to set the level of expectations and accountability. And then you get to choose how compelled your team members are by the relationships you build. And by doing that, you're going to have ultimately have tremendous success. So I want you guys, I hope you guys got some stuff out of this. Um, I'll, I'll stick around for a few minutes if you have questions. I'm going to share with Coach, uh, with Justin here, the, uh, the presentation so that you'll have this. My Twitter is at Coach Vent. My email is CoachVent at gmail.com. And I will tell you that our doors, not right now, our doors are not open. But soon they will be open at Estacada High School. We've, we have a lot of coaches come through. A lot of programs come through. We love to talk ball. We go visit other schools and talk ball. Um, so let us know if you want to come down and ever, if, if there's ever anything we can do. Our doors are open. And again, my email is just my name, CoachVent at gmail.com. If I can do anything for you, shoot me an email. Coach, I appreciate you putting this stuff no, on absolutely. and to help coaches, man. And I hope y'all got something out of this and I didn't bore you to death. No, no. This and and uh, Coach Holler and just just really summed it up how uh, how moving this this uh, this talk was for sure. There was there is a couple questions in here, Coach, and I do want to okay. uh, get those one uh, one from Coach Pruitt. Uh, you mentioned Dennis Parker earlier in your talk. Have you used his uh, coaching to change lives model in your program with weekly stories, vocabulary, and gratitudes. That's the first program. First thing we did back in 1999, first one we used was, uh, was coaching to change lives. And actually, I used to use it in my English classes. I made my kids every day start a class. I mean, we're in the Bronx. Kids are facing some tough stuff. And the school I was at in the Bronx is now closed. New York Post called it Horror High. I mean, we had a lot of issues within the school. What I'm proud to say is that out of the 150 kids that I had in my sophomore English class, five sophomore English classes in 1998, I keep in contact. There's probably 60 of those kids that I'm Facebook friends with. And a lot of them had success. And that we did two things that they still talk about, gratitudes and free riding. Every day we started with free riding because I look at riding. How do you get better at riding? Right. How do you get better at shooting free throws? Shoot free throws. So we did that. And then how do you change your mindset? Talk about what you're grateful for. And those are the things. We had to improve our riding. And they had to improve their mindset that the world's going to be a good place, that they're not a victim unless they choose to be and they can make something great out of themselves. And Dennis Parker's where I got those three gratitudes. And I start, my wife and I do it every day. My wife and I get up because football's hard. It's hard. So my wife and I, the greatest thing we did this fall was we started getting up uh, at six in the morning and we started, because we're not going to get a lot of evening time. We started, we borrowed time in the morning. And one of the things we'd each do is talk about what we were grateful for good things and that helped us when we face some of the tough things when you're not home for three or four nights in a row so yes dennis parker man phenomenal stuff that's awesome that's awesome uh did anyone else have any uh, questions for coach vent i'm sure i'm sure you just like myself you're, you're taking in all this information that we got man was, coach i'm telling you tremendous tremendous coach, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna send you a link for the pdf file of this yeah so you can put it into the google drive also that'd be awesome that would be awesome. Yep. I mean, <clears throat> you can see, uh, you know, once you unshare the screen, you can see the chat box and, and all the, the positive, uh, positive remarks that, that you're getting, and rightfully so. I mean, incredible stuff. Incredible stuff. I posted a couple things on my Twitter as you were speaking just because I, you know, had to get it on there. But, <laughs> cool, man. yeah, that's everybody, good. That's everybody wants that presentation. What's that? I said everybody wants the presentation. Good. I'll, I'll make sure. So I'll, I, as soon as we get done, before I do anything else, I'll share that with you. Yeah. Uh, anybody else for uh, questions? Please feel free. I know I kind of raced through a little bit of that. So. Uh, how did you handle homelessness with kids? That, I'll tell you, that is a situation, man, that is really, really tough. So – in every situation, it's a little bit different. 
Um, right now, we have a couple of kids that are in that situation. Number one, we're going to make sure. So I'll give you an example. A kid, we had a few. Uh, well, so it's been several years now. But every Friday, we had uh, a program. In Lubbock, we have food to kids. We had a similar thing in the Bronx where every – it was Tuesday and Friday. Uh, we had some – there were meals that were delivered. And what we would do is help provide those kids with some food uh, that they would take home for the weekend because nutrition's a big deal. Second thing is having peanut butter and jelly around. Third thing is, man, I had a kid stay at my house for six weeks. Uh, I mean, I was – a single coach. I had three bedroom apartment um, in the Bronx. So I had a kid that ended up staying with me. I had another kid that stayed for a couple weeks. Earlier this year, we had a kid in our program who spent a couple nights at the house. We had another kid who spent a couple nights with our uh, offensive line coach. I mean, I'm not exactly sure if you want to be a little more specific with what you're looking at, but we wanted to make sure that their Mavs, Maslow's needs are met. They got a roof over their head. Who are they staying with? If they need to have a place to sleep, if they're on the – they're going to sleep with us. They're going to find a place. We're going to find a place for them to stay where they got a roof over their head. It might be a teammate. It might be an uncle. It might be <coughs> a situation where they're going to stay um, at one of our coaches' house, a teammate. If it's a food uh, security issue, we're going to make sure that, that they have food that they're taken care of. Um, if it's a light bill issue, we're going to pay the light bill. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, I, and we're going to get a donation. It's not, you know, we, every one of us would do that for our kids. We'd give them a place to stay. We'd pay the light bill. We'd pay the electric bill if we have to um, because you care about them, you love them, and you, you want them to be safe. And we also don't want that situation to become worse where they don't come to us. I don't know if that answered your question or if you have a follow-up more specific. We'll see if uh, Coach Moreland follows up. Um, there's a coach uh, from Coach Miller. <clears throat> he said, <clears throat> I just, uh, yeah, uh, you answered Coach Mullen's question. Uh, okay. Another question says, I just lost a player to suicide. Have you ever had to deal with that? If so, how did you deal with this? I'm trying to, uh, trying to text every day to make sure the team is okay. Man, that, so earlier this year, I had a coach call me from West Virginia. Um, he was using a character program that I've spoken on at clinics called the real man program that I used when I was a head wrestling and head uh, boys and girls track coach. And he told me that he want, they were going school wide. He said, coach, let me tell you the situation that we're in. They had had five suicides in a semester. It, it broke my heart. I luckily as a coach, we've never had a successful suicide. We had one kid that tried and it didn't, you know, he wasn't successful. Thank goodness. And he's a great kid, happy kid, talented kid, smart kid, everything going. The last kid you'd think. But there were things going on. And I think that this is where, number one, you got, we got to see the warning signs. If a kid is withdrawn, it's really easy to say, well, that kid's got to pick it up or he's soft. But we've got to look at the warning signs. If you have a kid that's normally one way and he's acting a different way, there's something going on. We need to find out what's going on. I am not a counselor, a trained counselor, but every school has someone that is or access to someone. Find who that is in your building, make an appointment, take that kid there. Uh, I think that's important. Second is if it does happen, you have to bring the team together. I'm gonna, we did not face that this year. We faced a little different thing. We had a kid and it's, and it's sad. A kid that I coached at a different high school six years ago, and a kid that we had in our program at the school I'm at now got into a dispute. And one of them, 17, one, obviously, he's older. He's 24, 25. One of them shot the other one, and then someone shot that one. So this kid that was in our program was killed in a shooting in a nightclub New Year's Eve, 17. We called – we brought the team in Monday. We started to lift. We did a really quick one set or one lift, did a couple sets, and then we just brought him up. We stopped it. And our head coach, um, uh, and I'm going to tell you about Joe Cluley. If you ever, at Coach Cluley's is Twitter. You will not find a guy who loves kids more than him. And I've worked with some coaches that I thought I'd say that about, but Joe gets it. 
And uh, he, he said, we've got to do something. He, and he talked to us in the weight room. He said, I'm about to blow this up. We're going to bring him up and just tell him. He, we went around the room, and every coach got five minutes to tell the kids how much we love them. And at the end, then he talked about how he almost felt responsible because this kid was in our program. And we kind of, you know, I talked to you about we don't kick kids out, but he kind of filtered himself out. And as coaches, we got to draw that line of when do we get rid of a kid, when do we don't. But I think spending the time talking to your kids and letting them know that, and we told them, we love you, we care about you, we are here for you. We want you to be successful. We know that you face adversity every day. We know there are things that we don't understand because we didn't face the social media pressures. The, you know, people live dual lives. They live one life on social media than their actual life. You know, you'll see a kid have a BMW in a social media picture, but then his real house, you know, they don't have a car. So I think spending time letting the kids know how much you care about them, having that open door policy. And then once that something tragic like that happens is having a resource within your building that you can reach out to and then spending time letting your kids know that let's mourn together, let's grieve together, and then let's grow together. Um, let's take this and, and it's a family. We lost a family member. Let's grow from this. And I think that's, man, I mean, that's coach. I feel for you. And that's, tell me that coach's name again. Cause that's going in my prayer list. Uh, coach Miller, coach Miller. That's going in my little prayer list. And cause I, I feel for, for that situation. Yeah. He says, he tells them every day that he loves them. That's vital, man. And they, that's vital. You've got to tell kids and hug their necks and they've got to know. And if a kid has a bad day, hug him the most. Got another one here. Uh, coach, how did your coaches pull a lot of these needs off without the admin coming after you all? I was recently publicly fired here in uh, St. Louis for speaking out and fighting for players. And the last straw they got me on was for being friends with players on Facebook. My players contacted me via Facebook, the ones that didn't have con uh, constant cell phone service. I mandated weekly check-ins after a kid was killed at our jamboree. What you are doing is perfect. And often when we do great things, there will be those who don't understand that will castigate. There are those that they don't understand the relationship between coach player. They don't understand the family relationship. And there are people that are going to have personal agendas. Do not ever let it stop you. Don't let it discourage you. You'll find another place. That just meant that wasn't the right place for you to do it and keep in touch with those players. I'm Facebook friends with players. I'm Twitter friends with players. And it's a good thing. Now, we have boundaries, obviously, but what's going to happen is I'm going to see something on a kid's Facebook, and I'm going to bring it out and say, hey, man, probably got to take this down. This, this doesn't reflect you, you know, and, and it's their deal. They got freedom of speech, but for the most part, they listen to us. But um, uh, that's another deal there that just – if it gets to a situation, and I, I know this is easier said than done, where you can't believe in the administration you work for, find a new place because your health depends on it. You know, if your administration is, hand, is, is just hamstringing you so bad that it's taking away from your own ability to, to believe in what you're doing with kids and they're trying to, to hamstring you, you, you got to decide, can I do this or do I need to find another place to do it? Same deal if you're working. You know, if you're ever in a city, we always tell our coaches, if you ever don't believe in, in me or you don't believe in the head coach and you need to find a place where you will. Uh, same kind of deal there. Um, but there's a there's an app that I'm I I gotta set up a bunch of chats during this uh, coronavirus deal on an app called Band B A N D. It's free. Um, it's a free app. And what's nice about that there's another one that some of the schools down in Texas are using called Sports U, and it's free. Um, I'm pretty sure it's free. But Band is completely free, and you can set your team up on it. And what it does is it kind of gives you the same ability to have be able to track players, communicate with them. You can set different groups up, players, parents, quarterbacks, running backs. You can set all different groups up. You can have chats within chats to have your kids check in that way. And then you can have your admin approve it. And what it does is legally it helps because it gives you a record of – because their servers are recording everything. So that if there's ever a – he said you can sell that to your administration that way. Um, kind of like Remind, but this is way better than Remind because it looks like, I mean, it really looks like almost a Facebook feed. You can put video on there. You can put video messages to your team, schedule events, put practices up. Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff. You can even go live on it. Um, 
So I would recommend something like that. But as far as if you're facing an ad administration that is ruthlessly against you, man, you need to find a new administration to work for. And I know you don't want to do that because you're so bonded to the kids. Um, or you need to sit down with the administration and ask them. And I did this. I did this at a high school. And I said, what? We did this. Not I. We. We're a we us in our program. And that's all I've been a part of. We sat down with the admin and said, here is what we are asking. Why are these things being done? Why are you cutting us out of the weight room? Why are you not letting us use the weight room after school and opening it for sports that aren't using it? That, that happened. Why are you not letting us? They told us we couldn't get players rides anymore. Why are you doing this? What is the issue? We want to know your side. And what it turned out was it, was, it wasn't even a liability issue. It was just they thought that we were making the other programs look bad because we were doing so much with the kids. That is absolute crap. We're not trying to make anybody look bad. But that's, I think that's something you've got to do. And, again, I may not have given you a great answer. What you did was what you're supposed to do. And if I'm ever in a situation where I don't feel like our administration believes in us, we'll go somewhere else. Our principal, Angel uh, Angelica Wilbanks, unbelievable. We work, we, I'm in a lucky situation. Great head coach, phenomenal administration from top to bottom. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, everybody's, everybody's sentiments are the same, Coach. I mean, seriously, eye-opening um, presentation on, on so many different levels. And um, there was gems in, in, in each slide, really, you know. So um, even for the people that were not able to attend or, or miss out, the opportunity to play this back on the Google Drive, man, is going to be is going to be everything. So hopefully people get the message from, from seeing all the people tweeting out about uh, your presentation coach and, and they can once again if you miss it jump on and, and, and tag a friend man T tag a coach that you feel like needs to see his presentation because I know I know a handful of them you know what I mean and, and and that goes that that means just about everybody seriously appreciate your I appreciate that coach man it was seriously awesome awesome stuff I'm blessed man that we, I work with the best staff the best administration the best kids I mean we're just it's 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 a it's a treat to to do what we get to do every day now and, and i want you to understand everybody to understand that last the last little closing thought is no matter what you might be facing it's preparing you for something what your kids are facing is preparing them for something so take every situation every piece of adversity as an opportunity it's going to make you or break you but you get to choose and i think that's important if you love kids unconditionally put kids first do right by kids let everything else fall to the wayside, but make sure you got a purpose inside, a why that you'll go through the grind, a why that you'll go through that adversity. What is the impact that you're trying to make and make it every single day? And you're going to change kids' lives, and, and then you'll be able to say, I did the right thing. Amen. Amen. Couldn't agree more. I appreciate 